There was these two guys in Matthew chapter 9, verse 27. They were blind. You know what they were doing? They were following Jesus. Are you kidding? How can you follow someone if you can't see him? That means you're stumbling over things. That means you're bumping into things. That must have been some desperation. And you know what they were doing? They were crying out. And the word there in the, in the original, that crying out, they cried out so much and so long they lost their voice. They started sounding like birds squawking. Finally, Jesus stopped. I'm going to tell you if, you, if you set a trap for Jesus by becoming desperate enough, you can stop even Jesus. You can stop God. And let me, let me tell you what happens when, when he stops. He comes to you because you can't get to him. And because he comes to you, he will not leave you where you're at. He'll take you with him. I want to go with him to the front line, don't you? You know why we don't see the wonders that our fathers told us about? Because we're not on the front line. The front line where light and dark clash, where the kingdom of the earth, the kingdom of darkness, and the kingdom of our God clash. That's where the miracles happen because the front line is where the, the battle's won. And if we could stop God by our faith, I'm thinking of blind Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10 when he cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me! And the religious people, would you please be still? You're ruining our service. We've got to get through the sermon, and we've got to get to the open altar time. We've got to get the offering. We've got to have the, you, you're just messing. And, and the more they tried to quiet him up, son of David, have mercy on me. I just think some people need to get desperate enough to mess up the service. I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. I think our faith can stop God. I think God is known by a lot of things. He's who can get their mind around God. I mean, he's known as the son of righteousness with healing in his wings, Malachi 4, 2. But Joshua's faith stopped the son for a whole day. He stopped God. He, he's, he's, he's known as the river of life. He, he's known as, as, as cleansing waters. And the high priest's faith stopped the river, didn't they? Is that right, church? He's known as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And Daniel's faith stopped the mouth of the lion. I just think our faith could stop God. We could lay an ambush. And if he really would come to us, we would never be the same. Hallelujah, church. That's what I want to happen these four days. I don't want to just be 20 different churches coming together or whatever. I just want to be one church coming together where Jesus is the head and we're the body. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We need the Holy Spirit. We need him to come. We, we need him to take over. We, we, he's a person. Jesus, Jesus spoke of him. He said when he has come. He's a person. He needs to be loved. He needs to be honored. He needs to be respected. He needs to be in charge. Amen. I, I, I love, I love the, the, the word pictures of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. I, 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 like, I like Hebrews 12, 29. It says, our God's a consuming fire. The Holy Spirit's fire. That, that pillar of fire led those children of Israel every night for a, lot of, for a lot of years. I like the symbol of fire. Don't you? He, he's the river of life. He's oil. The, he's the anointing oil in Psalms 133. When brothers dwell together in unity, it's like the oil on Aaron's head that goes down over his beard and covers his whole body. He's, he's referred to as the balm of Gilead. He's, he's referred to as the healer God. He, he's, he has so many names. But you know what I love? I love the picture of the dove when I'm talking about the Holy Spirit because it just seems like it's so personal. Is that right, church? It, a, a dove. In John 132, when he wrote that book, he said, I, I, I baptized him. When he came up, I saw the dove come down, and it remained on him. It stayed on him. You know why Jesus could do Acts 10, 38, wherever he went, going around delivering everybody oppressed to the devil because God had anointed him? You know why, he, you know why Jesus batted a 1,000? Because he never chased off the dove. I don't think they were trying to get people in the place where Peter's shadow could touch him. I think they were trying to get people in a place where the dove that was sitting on Peter's shadow could touch him. I think we need to host and steward the presence of the Holy Spirit. But let me tell you, there's two and a half things he can't work with. How about that? 
never. I, I don't mean sometimes. I mean there's two and a half things he cannot work with ever. Number one is sin. You, if, you, if you're sinning and then you come and you talk churchy and you act churchy, I don't care if you're Baptist, Calvinist, Nazarene, Pentecostal, it doesn't matter. If you're acting churchy and you got the church mask on but there's sin in your life, you're not with the Holy Spirit. You're with some other spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? He can never work with sin. He can't work with fear unless you fear him because fear is the opposite of faith. And if there's fear in your life, you're not in faith. And without faith, you can't please God. And anything you do in your life that doesn't take faith is sin. So you better get rid of the fear so you can get back in faith. Amen? He cannot work with sin. He cannot work with fear. And the thing he can't work with half the time is ignorance. He can work with you until you, until you know better. And then it's no longer ignorance. Then it becomes stupidity. I want God to take over this weekend. This devastation of this tornado. I, I, I read that story in Mark chapter 4 when Jesus said, let's get in the boat, let's go through. Remember, we're going through. And immediately a violent tornadic wind blew up that was out of nowhere. And the disciples are freaked out. But Jesus is sleeping because where he's from, violent storms are like praise and worship before the main service. I mean, that's, that's where he's from. The storms, the clouds, the lightnings, the thunder, that's just like praise music in heaven. And, and, and the, they, Jesus, don't you care we're going to drown? Jesus came up, and he was so full of peace that all he did was say, peace be still. And it, and it, not, only calmed the, it not only calmed their little church, but it calmed the whole atmosphere. And I think if, if we could really get so filled with the God of heaven in this place, it wouldn't just affect us in this room. It would affect the whole atmosphere. And the, and the, and the amount of the great, the great and mighty storm that, that made the disciples afraid, there was a great and mighty calm that was a result of Jesus being in the house. And I believe what the devil has meant for harm, the greatest revival in the Midwest could come out of. That's what I believe. Man, so I like the dove. Doves have two wings. I love it. Isn't that amazing? A lot of people try to have one wing doves. Depends on which side you're on. Well, what I'm saying is if you're going to be like Jesus, the, the purpose of the Bible is to make disciples. Disciples are people with companionship that's intimacy with the one they're trying to emulate or mimic. And we're supposed to be disciples of Jesus. And so that means if we're going to be like Jesus, we have to have the Word and the Spirit. We have to have ethics and purity and power. We, 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 we have to have form and fire. We have to have doctrine and display. You, you see, we just can't say, well, I'm going to be on this side because it feels good. It's emotional. Or I'm just going to be on this side because I can manage it. No, if you're going to be like Jesus, that means you let the Holy Spirit live in you. You have to be Acts 17. I live and move and have my being in him. Amen. And, and so, you know, we're the vine, or he's the vine, we're the branches. And if we're plugged into him, his fruit is going to grow through us. It's not our fruit, it's his fruit. Is that right? And, and I believe there's, there, there, there's nine different manifestations of God's fruit. There's nine gifts of the Spirit. I believe one wing is the fruit. I believe the other wing is the Spirit. I believe we need the Holy Spirit to take us so that he does what he wants in, on, and through us, not us manipulating him and putting him in our comfortable box, but him manipulating us and putting us in his unlimited kingdom where there's no limit. Amen? And, and, and so, you know, <clears throat> I think what's going to happen these four days, if you'll bring people that are hungry for God's glory, is we will be a bunch of sticks, not just plugged into the vine, but we will be a bunch of sticks that are building ourselves into a bonfire. And when that happens, all the snakes come out, and that's revival. Individual fires, the snakes can still hide in the church and your family, but if everybody catches fire, they, don't, they can't handle the heat of heaven. They're used to the heat of hell, but the heat of heaven is a different kind of heat. Amen. Are you with me? Now, if you amen me, we'll be done before midnight. If you don't, I don't know. Just help me. Amen. Amen. 
I, I don't think if, you, if you're filled with the Spirit of God, if you're truly a believer that's been regenerated and adopted into his kingdom and his family and you're filled with his Spirit, then you have love that's not your love because one of the fruit is love. Because 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. And John three sixteen for God so loved the world that he gave. So if you're full of God's love, you're willing to give your life. If you're giving your life for others, not for your own benefit, but for the benefit of others. And so if you're really in Christ and you're really filled with the Spirit, then you have that love in you. If it's not in you, then you're not in the Spirit. Are you with me, church? I mean, it's love. It's agape love. It's not self-serving. It's God serving and others serving. Amen. And, and I think if you're filled with the Spirit, you have joy. Amen. It's not an emotion. It's a state of being. You know what it is? It's like when the wall, it's like when the town is a third destroyed, but you don't lose heart because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah 8.10. It's not your joy. It's his joy. And, and so if, if you're filled with that spirit, if that dove is on you, if he's resting on you, then you have joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. In fact, you don't even know where it's coming from. In fact, sometimes the worse the circumstances, the more the joy. And if that really manifests in your life, then people come up to you and they say, how can you have joy? And it gives you an excuse to give them a reason for the hope that lies within you, 1 Peter 3.15. If you don't have any joy, they'll never ask you nothing. If you're full of the Spirit, you'll have peace. Oh, my word, love, joy, peace. I, I think if you keep your mind stayed on him, he'll keep you in perfect peace, Isaiah 26, 3. I, I, I think the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, Philippians chapter 4. I think you're going to get some peace. And I'm, and I'm not saying that like an arm a peace or a good-looking lady peace. I'm saying the kind of peace that only Jesus can give you, John 14, 27. He says, I give you my peace, and the world can't take it away because it didn't give it to you. It's the only kind of peace that God has, and he gives it to us. And so if you have the Spirit of God in you, tonight in the midst of storms, you have peace. Hallelujah. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have patience. Oh, my word. God is a God of patience, Romans 15, 5. He is a God of patience. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have kindness. That's Isaiah 54, 10. His kindness never ends. Are you kind? If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you're kind. Even to your spouse. Even to your kids. Isn't it good to have the Holy Spirit in you? If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you're gentle. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, if you yoke up with Jesus, you're going to find out how gentle and lowly he is. And if you let him fill you with his spirit, you're going to be a gentle, kind, loving, faithful, peaceful person. That sounds almost contagious, doesn't it? If you have the Holy Spirit, if you have goodness, Nahum 1, 7 says God is good. And if you're filled with him, there's goodness in you. And it's not your goodness, it's his goodness. There's no goodness in us. But if you got him in you, there's no end to the goodness. Amen. If you have the Holy Spirit, if you have the Holy Spirit, there's faithfulness. Lamentations 3.23 says, great is thy faithfulness. Psalms 136, it says, his mercy endures forever. His love endures forever, over and over again. How faithful is he forever? His mercy's new every day. And if, and if we have him in us, we're faithful. Self-control. Man. Uh, I'm going to tell you, if God doesn't have self-control, none of us are here. Is that right? I mean, somebody might die for a good person, maybe, or a friend. But Christ demonstrated his love for us, and while we were yet sinners, he died for us, Romans 5 eight. He, he, he died for us because he had self-control. Church, you have those nine fruits in you if you're filled with the Spirit. If you don't have those in you, then you need to surrender your life because God doesn't share space. He doesn't take up squatter's rights. With him, it's all or nothing. 
And if you don't have that manifested in your life, then you need to have that before you leave the room tonight. Amen? Amen. I believe nine is a biblical number that is a number that stands for a completed or a finished work. It's not seven, perfection. It's not six, man. It's not three, trinity. It's not 12, government. It's nine. It's, it's completion. It's something that's completed. It's, I think that's why there's nine fruits. I think that's why there's nine beatitudes. I think that's why those living creatures in Revelation 4 cry, holy, 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 nine times. I think that's why the commentators that I read say that Job's story is nine months. I, th- I think that's why there are nine generations from Perez to David. And Perez stands for breakthrough. I, I just believe that nine is a completed work. And I think there's nine f- manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit. I think there's also nine gifts of the Spirit. I don't mean the gifts that God gives to everybody on the planet. I'm not talking about the fivefold gifts that the apostles, evangelists, prophets, pastors, teachers... I'm not talking about those. I'm not talking about the gifts he gives to everybody. Everybody has a gift or a talent. on the, Even if you're not a Christian, you get a gift from God. Did you know that? There's a lot of sinners that have gifts of administration. Helps, encouragement, faith. I'm talking about the gifts of the Spirit as found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's nine of them. It's a completed work. You know what divides the church a lot? I know you're not going to believe this because you all came together. But people perverting the gifts of the Spirit give gifts a bad name. And you know what that does? That causes about 80% of the church world to believe in a Holy Spirit with one wing. How can a Holy Spirit come in a room if he can't fly? Anybody with me? If you'll just help me, we'll get done earlier. So, so what I want to do is I want to preach through 1 Corinthians 12 right quick. Can we do that? Turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 12. getting hot in here. Do we got an air conditioner? Is Mark in charge of that? Turn it down, Mark. Praise God. They're going to be a big love offering. Pay for that electricity. Praise God. 1 Corinthians 12. You ready? Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. I want to point out two words here in that first verse. First, the word, the word is brethren. This is referring to anybody who's concreted into their faith and not going anywhere. These, the, this, is, this, is the, this is the ones that it refers to in Ephesians 3, now, now that you are being rooted and grounded in love. You're, you're, you're grounded in wet concrete, and it sets up, and you're never leaving your dad's face. Are you with me? If you're a brethren, you're not easily moved by any new wind or doctrine. This is people who have gone past spiritual hump day, and it's just easy for them to finish strong than to ever turn back. And so if that's you, the gifts are for you. Amen. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. That word ignorant has two meanings in the Greek language. Number one, he doesn't want us to lack knowledge. It's not head knowledge. It's, it's spirit knowledge. Are you with me? Without knowledge, my people perish. Hosea 4.6. He wants us to have, that's why Paul, in every one of his prayers, he prayed that we would increase in wisdom, revelation, and knowledge. Ephesians 1.17, Philippians 1.9, Colossians 1.9, it doesn't matter. He always wanted us to have more knowledge. This word, don't lack, don't be ignorant, also means he doesn't want us to lack revelation. We don't get revelation unless we're intimate. If you want to hear clear from God, you must be near his heart. Are you with me? You can't have a form. You've got to have the fire. Amen. Without revelation, we cast off restraints and we fall for anything. Proverbs 29, 18. So we can't live on past. You have to live on today. Amen. The next verse says, you know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols. However, you were led. I'm going to pull out the one word idol. You ready? The thing that keeps people from operating in the gifts the way God wants them to is because of idols. There's three definitions I'm going to give you. Number one, anything or anyone you have to ask permission of before you answer God. That could be your spouse. Anything that blocks the vision of God as your pursuit, your passion, your destiny is an idol. And number three, Anything that takes the time and space necessary to hear from the Holy Spirit on a daily basis is an idol.
I'm not getting a lot of amens there, but I'm telling you, if you're not hearing from God, how do you know what his revelation is? How do you know what his knowledge is if you're not hearing from him? And if you're not hearing from him, it's not his fault because he's talking all the time. His sheep hear his voice. I mean, it's like Niagara Falls when he speaks. He says, let there be light. It's still going. It's 101 billion light years across, and it's still expanding just because he spoke. Don't, don't, you know, God speaks, things happen. Psalms 33, 9. Better, better start listening. Hey, you know, Ravenhill, Leonard Ravenhill said, the reason why revival won't come is because people are talking too much. I need to start listening. Amen. And idols are things that keep us occupied so we can't hear God. Forty-nine times in the book of First and Second Kings, the word of the Lord came. He's always speaking. He's trying to get us to hear him so we can obey. Amen? Verse number three. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to point this out to you right now. There's 35 verses that call Jesus Savior, one who forgives your sins. But there's 700 and some verses that call him Lord, one who wants to reign supreme over every aspect of your life. And if you're one who just has a 911 God who keeps continually forgiving you, but he hasn't been made Lord yet, the gifts aren't for you. The gifts are for holy people that have pure hearts. Are you with me, church? There are different kinds of gifts by the same Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit, Numa, breath of God. Different kinds of ministries by the same Lord. That's the word kurios. That's the supreme anointed one, Jesus the Son. And different kinds of activities by the same God who works all in all. The word God is theos or Father God. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For the profit of all. For the profit of all. You know, there's only one reason why he gives the gifts. Okay, I'm going to tell you this right now. It's so that every single one of us can be built together and made one perfect man where we're in perfect proportion to the head, which is Jesus. He doesn't give the gifts so that somebody's a superstar. There's only one superstar in the kingdom. It's Jesus. And and if someone tells you, well, I'm operating in the gifts, but they're doing nothing but dividing the body, they better ask which spirit they're using gifts of because the gifts of the Spirit are so all of us can be made one where nobody's left out. Because when we get into one accord, it happened five times just in the book of Acts. People raised from the dead, fire falls, foundations shake, people get out of jail. Just when you get in one accord. And the reason why God gives the gifts of the Spirit is so that we can all benefit I want you to hear that, church. He always saves the best for last, but he can't pour out the best until we're all in one accord. Then he goes into the gifts. He says, for one is given wisdom, and to another word of knowledge, and to another faith. He goes down through the nine gifts. The, The wisdom gift is truth. How about who needs truth? I need truth, don't you? Solomon said in Proverbs 4, 7, when all you're getting, make sure you get wisdom. It's the main thing, right? Proverbs 4, 7. James says, if you lack wisdom, ask God, he'll give it to you. But I'm I'm saying, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have truth. The truth sets us free. Whom whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. So if the Holy Spirit's in you, you have wisdom that's not yours. It's God's truth. And then it says, and to another, knowledge. This is when God sends the solution to a problem. Who needs that one? I do. I was preaching a revival just over in Springfield, Missouri, and the Lord gave me a word of knowledge that someone was being healed, and I was afraid to say it because I, I'm sorry, but I was raised in a one wing church. I'm not anymore, but I was raised in it. Now I got two wings. Makes some people nervous, but it's okay. But I was afraid to say it. I was in Nixon, Missouri. And I, I let about five minutes go by, and I said, okay, I'm, I can't talk because God confused me, and I couldn't talk. And I said about five minutes ago, someone was being healed, but I was afraid to say it. And when I said it, a lady stood up. She said it was me. She said I hurt my arm on a mission trip going in for surgery. But about five minutes ago, I felt this pop, and my arm's on fire, and there's no pain. 
And when, and when she said that, about 400 people rushed to the altar. I like it when the dove preaches. He preaches good messages. Anybody with me? I mean, he, I mean you, you, if we could just do a 10-day prayer meeting like they did in Acts, then you could preach like a 30-second message and let the dove take over like Peter did and 3,000 people get in. What are we hosting, right? What are we, who are we honoring? Is it, is it some religion or is it the Holy Spirit? Amen. And so when those people came to the altar that, that night, 200 people were filled with the Spirit. 75 people were born again and 37 people were healed because a word of knowledge, but it wasn't just for her. It's for the profit of all. Then it says, and to another faith. This is, a, this is an awesome gift to the Spirit. This is the ability to see something in its potential, not like it is. I know, you're, I know your finances are a mess. I know your marriage is in trouble. I know, I know the house. I know the cities. In, I, know, I know what it is now, but if you just keep your eyes on Jesus, this is what it's going to be. And, and it, it is the ability to see potential, not as it is, but as it will be. That's a contagious gift, isn't it, church? If you look between every single one of these gifts, there's a word there, alos, A-L-O-S, and to another. This is, has two meanings. It means every one of these gifts is working in you in conjunction with the other. For instance, when I spoke that word that there was somebody being healed, that was the gift of faith, that was a prophetic utterance, that was a word of knowledge, that was the gift of tongues, that was all the gifts working in conjunction with one another. So every single one of you, if you're filled with the Spirit, even though you don't know if that wing really does exist, they're in you. It's Ephesians 3.20. God can do exceedingly abundant more than you can ever ask or imagine according to the power that's at work within you. They're already within you. But the second meaning of that word, and to another, alos, it means if, if I or you operate in the gifts, the charismata, and it benefits someone next to you, it give them a quickening in their spirit to minister to someone next to them and someone next to them, and someone, and before long, everybody would be ministering and to another. And that's the way the body of Christ should operate, because then we become one perfect man. I was a year and a half ago in Orange, Texas, and I was preaching on the Holy Spirit, and I sensed that a lid came in on top of the congregation. And I knew it was pride. I knew it was disobedience. And it was about 300 there. There was 11 churches to came together. Ray McDowell was the pastor. And I, I didn't know what to say about this lid, but God let me see discerning of spirits. I mean, I, if you're in the spirit, you have the gifts. And I didn't want to say this because I was with this district superintendent named Dr. Dwayne Schrader. And that was a year and seven, six months ago. And I was trying to get meetings in. Now I've had over a thousand calls. So I'm not trying to get meetings now. But back then, I was worried about my reputation a little bit, you know. And so I was afraid to say, well, I'm sorry, you guys. In Orange, Texas, you got a lid on your people. But I had to say it because God said, say it. And so when I said there's a lid, I lay, uh, it was real quiet for like a minute. And it seemed like an hour. And then a lady stood up and she said, it's my fault. And I said, what would you do? And she said, well, um, I led worship tonight. I said, yes, you did. She goes, I didn't pray or fast to try to get God's heart. I just worried more about how I would sound. And she said, I need to pray. And so she came to the altar, and then 200 people followed her. And I'm telling you, and, and see, I'm a Nazarene, so we're, more, we're not as free as some people. But in that service, every aisle filled with people laying on their faces. The whole platform filled, they're laying on their faces, and they're all crying out and repenting because of spiritual pride. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm just trying to explain and to another. I spoke the word in the charisma, the gifts of the spirit. It gave a lady courage to repent. Her courage gave 200 people courage to repent. See, and to another. See, it's not about me. And it's not about you. It's about us and him. Okay. It's about the kingdom, right? 
And, and so I looked around, and there was no lid. I looked over, there was a lady sitting here, and I said, ma'am, I need to pray for you. And she said, yes, and she was in pain. I put my hand on her head, and she fell down. We don't do that either. <sighs> Holy smokes. I tried to pick her up real fast. I think I, I think I yanked her arms out of socket. I mean, I don't know. I said, how do you feel? She goes, I feel great. I don't have any pain. So she laid hands on a 60-some-year-old lady next to her, and she just, I guess, had back surgery because she was the secretary of that church. And the 60-some-year-old lady started doing toe touches. Are you kidding? And then she laid hands on somebody, and they laid hands on somebody, and then before long there was like 10, 12 people just praying for each other and to another. And see, without the Holy Spirit, I'm not talking about... You see, some people, they live in that dove, that wing, so it's just emotionalism. (laughs) But without the Holy Spirit, we've reduced church to a spectator sport where people come in a room and they sit there and they expect somebody to bring a good word. But if we were really kingdom people, we would all come so full of the word that we could all minister to each other and to another. And I looked over, there was a man on the front row. And I said, I need to pray for you. And he came up and he, I said, there's four arrows in your heart in the back. There's four arrows. I just need to pray for you. And he just started weeping. He was a pastor. He said, I had 40 people leave my church a couple of weeks ago and they're all talking behind my back. And he said, when you said that, I have hope. He was, in, he was a pastor in Port Arthur, Texas, and now he's in Bentonville, Arkansas. His name is Mark Snodgrass. There's a church of about 300, maybe a little more. He told me this year, a year later, he said that night changed my life. And it wasn't me. It was the gifts of the Spirit operating in the body as they're intended to operate. Amen. The next night when I went from Orange, Texas, I went to Lake Houston. I was preaching, no lid. I said, who wants to die and get made holy and get filled with the Spirit so you can walk like Jesus? And 200 people came forward. It was awesome. I looked over and there was a lady sitting on the front row. I said, I need to pray for her. And I went over to her and she said, I knew you were going to pray for me. I said, how'd you know that? She goes, you know, you know that girl last night you knocked down? I said, how'd you hear about that? Are you kidding? Holy smokes. She goes, that was my daughter. She hadn't slept for two years because she's in so much pain. And she called me this morning and said, Mama, God healed me and he can heal you. And see, that that daughter was doing the gift of faith over the phone to her mom and to another. I'm telling you, if you just get rid of sin, fear, and ignorance and start flowing in the spirit, the repercussions go on and on and on and on. And it's for everybody. It's for everybody to benefit so we can be one. Amen. So I prayed for that lady. I didn't know anything about her. The next week I was in Abilene, Texas. I got a call from that lady. Her name was Pam Runyon. She was a pastor's wife. She said, Brother Dan, you don't remember me? I said, no. Well, I'm the guy, lady you prayed for. Yeah, you, yeah. Well, she goes, for 18 years I've had lupus and fibromyalgia, terrible pain. She was a missionary for 10 years. Now they've been pastoring for 10 years. She's been sick. She goes, for the past week, I've been running three miles a day. I don't have any pain since you laid your hands on me. I just wanted you to know that. And, and, and so, and to another is very important in the gifts. They're supposed to flow and to another. Are you with me? And to another, uh, the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healings. This is when God sends the cure. Who needs a cure? Are you kidding? Hospitals are, that's the best industry to be in. Because everybody's sick. We need a cure, don't we? And one of the gifts of the Spirit is God wants to send the cure through the body of Christ to heal itself. I love that, don't you? Last year on Easter, I was in Midland, Michigan, and a little nine-year-old boy named AJ came up and said, Brother Bohai, will you pray for me? I have cerebral palsy. I said, yeah. I just prayed for him. And I've gotten three emails from their family. They went to three different doctors. He doesn't have it. God healed him. I laid hands on a lady in Nashville, Tennessee, who had multiple sclerosis, and God healed her of her MS. And 
I laid hands on a lady who had three weeks to live with cancer, and God healed her. And I, she, I, I just believe that one of the gifts is God wants to sin to cure her, but he can't work with sin, fear, ignorance. And there's a difference between being cured and made whole. I want to make this pretty clear because the law of healing really has to do with being made whole. Rafa, to mend together by a tapestry of grace, to heal, to cure, to make whole. Ionomai, the New Testament word, same exact definition. The end result is that we would be made whole. I do believe there's some people that have been made whole that haven't received the cure yet. I think Joni Erickson Todd has been made whole. God uses her because she hasn't been cured. I don't understand that, but it's part of the truth of the gospel. I think Bill Bright is more whole right now than any of us in this room. He didn't get the cure. So the gifts of healing are when God sends the cure. It'd be a sad thing to be healed of cancer and lose your soul. See, I, I'm not out there on one wing or the other. I'm just like right in the middle where the wing's guiding me. I'm not making disclaimers. I'm just telling you what the Word says. Amen? And to another, is it working of miracles? Yes, that's when God gives you the ability to focus and operate as dunamis. We need power, don't we, church? In impossible situations. That's one of the gifts of the Spirit. And to another prophecy, that's when God will let you foretell, foretell, edify, comfort, encourage, remind each other not to give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but all the more we need to encourage each other because the day is getting closer. Prophetia, reading the heart, letting God give you a prophetic utterance so you can encourage someone, comfort one, edify someone. If you're going to do the fourth telling or foretelling, make sure that you're right. Because if you're not, don't go outside in the tornado. You won't be here. God hates false prophets, okay? Um, and then, then to another discerning of spirits. This, let me tell you what this is. This is the ability to make a judicial estimation of people or a person's spiritual vitality at that moment in time. It's not the ability to make a condemnational estimation. And it's not the ability to make a judgmental estimation. It's God giving you his heart so you have his eyes and you can see things as he sees them. If you go around telling people what to do, saying, I have discernment, that's Plankville. You got it. And to another, different kinds of tongues. This is Genos Glossae. The real purpose for this whole gift is supernatural communication so that we can be made kin, kinfolk. This is the definition in the Greek language. It is a supernatural ability to articulate a prayer, a song, or a message in a way you didn't discern or come up with. There's some people that think the only way that tongues is, is, a, is manifested is in the prayer language of the tongues of angels in 1 Corinthians 13. But if that was the case, then three-course the body of Christ would not have the Spirit. And so I don't choose to believe that. I believe that tongues manifest in many ways in a message, a song, a prayer, in a way you didn't come up with, but it's always a supernatural mode of communication that's greater than you. That's, that's, the, that's the definition in the Greek language. Now, if you want to add on to that, that's your deal. I don't add to the word, Deuteronomy 4.2. I'd like to just stick to the word. It's safer. The application for this gift would be you could have a prayer language or you could speak in another language. You could go speak Espanol and don't know how, but you could just do it. Or you could do Acts chapter 2 and you could just have a prayer of the heart or whatever and 18 nationalities would hear the gospel, some supernatural communication gift. Are you with me? Or you could do an act of service unto God, like take a meal to someone who can't provide for themselves. And if you're doing it not to get your name in your church bulletin, but if you're doing it as an act to God because you want to glorify God, that person who receives that meal don't, won't just get the message to their stomach. There'll be a supernatural articulation to their heart, and they'll know God loves them. That's an application of glossé. The way you take care of your property could be tongues. I'm going to explain. There's a man in the, in the, in the stream of Christian perfection all the way through the ages. His name was Finelin. 
and he got baptized in the spirit because he got so desperate for God because one day he watched his neighbor grooming his orchard and mowing his hay field. And this is back in the 17th century. And because he saw the way this man manicured his farm, God took that as a message and pierced his heart and he repented and he got filled with the spirit. So don't put God in your box. Let him yank you to his box. Usually when I preach, this is prophetia, because I'm reminding us, I'm exhorting the ecclesia, the brethren, the concreted in. Usually when I preach, there'll be a dozen people come up to me and say, you were preaching to me. No, I wasn't. That's glossy. That's tongues. That's God taking the fire of his word. God's word is a fire, Jeremiah 23, 29. And individualizing the flames for individual hearts, for messages from God's heart through my heart to your heart. That's Colossians 4, 3 and 4. The mysterion, the utterance of God, reveals the deep hidden truths of God through human lips from God's heart to your heart. And then interpretation. If, if, if tongues pierces a heart or edifies a heart or communicates a message to a heart, there's always interpretations that follows. Tonight, if the Word of God pierces your heart, because the Word of God is pretty sharp, it's living, right? It's active, and it wants to avoid soul and spirit, joint and marrow, even the dividing of thoughts and motives. It won't leave you broken, though. It'll cut you and give you a broken and contrite heart where God won't despise you, Psalms fifty one seventeen. But it won't leave you broken. The interpretation of that spirit will follow that message and say, if you'll just come and repent, I can bind up the broken heart and make you stronger than you ever were before. And in the last verse, it says, But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one, to each one. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one of us as He wills. Are you with me? So everybody here, if you're full of the Spirit, if you've got the dove in you and on you, you have the fruit and the gifts. All of us do. That verse is saying this. God is always willing all the time to give all of us all the gifts. We're not willing to take them. Hallelujah. Now, I think it's because gifts lay dormant when there's no fire. Paul said to Timothy, fan into flame, the gift of God is within you, right? So I think you could have the Holy Spirit and not have any fire. How about that one? I know that John baptized people in Luke 3, 3 for forgiveness, right? But Jesus has another baptism. It's the Holy Spirit and fire, Matthew three eleven. I believe the Holy Spirit is the power of God. Let me tell you why. In, in Acts 1.8, it says you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And, it, and it, power to be what? To be a martyr. To be my witness. That's the word martus. It means if you're going to get the dunamis of heaven on earth as it is in heaven, you've got to be willing to die. Hey, guess what? That's power and purity again. We can't separate the dove. He's either coming... As he is or he's not coming. And if you're not living pure, sanctified lives, don't tell me about your gifts. I don't want to stand by in a lightning storm. Amen. Anybody happy? I believe when you get the Holy Spirit, you get power to be a son of God. John 1, 12. He gives you power. You get adopted. You get power to be a child of God. I believe when you receive... The baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, you get, you get power to live a holy life. You get power to forgive people when you don't want to because it's not your power, it's His. You get power to love people that persecute you. You get power to turn the other cheek, go the second mile, give your coat too. It's power. And I believe the fire is the passion to use the power. And so what good would it be for me to have a Mercedes 550 SEL, $122,000, 423 horsepower, Sitting out there in the parking lot if I didn't have any gas. What a shame. And what good, what does it make God feel like with all the people that go to church every week that have the Holy Spirit, but they don't have any passion to use the power? Are you with me? 
We don't lose the Holy Spirit. He said he would never leave us. Deuteronomy 31, 5, he said, I'll never forsake you. Joshua 1, I'll never leave you. Matthew 28, I'm with you to the end. Philippians 1, 6, I'm going to finish what I started. Hebrews 13, 5, I'll never leave you or forsake you. You know, if you love God, the Holy Spirit's in you, so where's the fire? And here's what we do when we're in the church for a while. We say, well, I'm mature now. Or I'm dignified. Or I have some balance. Or I used to be on fire, but I outgrew it. And I think it's just excuses that you've lost the fire. You've lost your passion. And if you don't have the fire, you have all this stuff that's the Holy Spirit in you, and it's just laying dormant. And we wonder why the church just lays dormant. And we wonder why 85% of churches in America are shrinking. And we wonder why 90% of Christians never reproduce. And we don't really have to wonder. We just need to get the fire back. Am I right, church? Paul knew about this when he preached to the Romans. In Romans 12, he said, Therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercy, I beseech you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, which is your reasonable act of worship. He doesn't want one sacrifice. He wants everybody to offer their bodies as living sacrifices because he likes it when everybody gets on fire because then the world's turned upside down with just a few people. Amen, Amen church. There's, they, they, these, these were people that understood this Jewish law, this Aaronic priesthood. They, they understood the sacrifices like the burnt offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, the, hay, the wave offering, the peace offering, the grain offering, the... The sin offering, but all those offerings had to do with what God could do for us except for the burnt offering. It had everything to do with what we could do to bless God. And if you're going to be a living sacrifice, it's no longer about you. It's all about trying to bring glory and honor to God. Jesus said, I've finished the work you gave me to do so I could bring glory to your name. He created every one of us to be like him. So we've got to become a living sacrifice, a burnt offering. A burnt offering could be any kind of animal. It doesn't matter. What, what matters is it has to be the thing you you have to be willing to give up, the one thing you're afraid to give up to be a burnt offering. God told Abraham to take Isaac and make him a burnt offering. You can't just say, well, I'm on the altar if you're still holding on to things you want to hold on to. And the reason why Paul said, I want you to be living sacrifices, because he knew burnt offerings were, were the one offering that never, you, you don't, it never goes out. Morning and night, the fire is burning. Morning and night. Morning and it's just on fire. And if you're on fire, the attributes of the Holy Spirit, the attributes of Jesus are continually working through you because they're not laying dormant. Amen, church. I'm trying to preach fast. You'll come back. You could use a bull, a cow, a ram, a sheep, goat, pigeon, duck, doesn't matter. I like the sheep because I think we're all like sheep. We need a shepherd. He would bring a blemishless lamb, put it on the altar, cut its throat, peel its flesh, take off its limbs, take out its inside, cut off its fat. God would consume it. The priest would gather up the ashes, get rid of them when it's done, clean off the altar and start again because you're never supposed to let the fire go out. You've got to continually offer yourselves as living sacrifices. Um, the blemishless lamb would represent your outward life. A, a lamb without spot or wrinkle, no defects. That would, be, that would be you studying to show yourself approved, living worthy of the calling God's given you, living above reproach, working hard with your hands to earn the respect of outsiders. That's your outward life. A blemishless lamb. The first thing you're to do is to cut the throat and to bleed it. That means he wants you alive. He doesn't want just dead people in the pews of a church. He wants living sacrifices because the life's in the blood. He wants, um, then it says to peel the flesh. And then that means you're supposed to not let it grow up around God's sacrifice. That means if you have a thought, you need to repent. That means if you say something in anger, you need to repent. That means if you tell a white lie and exaggerate, you need to repent. It means you keep the flesh peeled. Are you with me, church? And, and this is all done in public, by the way. Oh, this is the good part. The offering was never in the closet. It was always front and center. You had to go through the altar to go anywhere because you couldn't get into God's presence until you went through the altar. 
the altar was the lead into the holy place and the holy of holies, but you had to go through the altar. And the altar is what sanctifies the gift, Matthew 23, 19. Jesus is the altar. Am I, are you with me? And so this altar is front and center. I mean, everything you put on here, God has total access to it. It's his. Once it's on there, don't take it back. You'll get scorched. Then it says to cut off the legs and cut off the limbs. I think this is your hands. I think this is, let me, let me hear me. If you cut your hands off, your hands are no longer slaves to sin, but they're slaves to righteousness, which lead to holiness, which lead to eternal life. If you give God your hands, they're no longer yours. You could actually lay your hands on sick people and they'd recover because they're no longer yours. They're his. If you give God your hands, you could actually have holy hands to lift up in praise. If you give God your hands, you could work hard and everything you put your hands to, you could prosper because they're not your hands. But he wants them on the altar. Amen. Then it says, put your feet on there, which I I think if you give God your feet, oh, my word, you could actually walk in the ancient pathway that leads to rest for your soul, Jeremiah 6, 16. You could actually walk around something enough times that it would fall down because it would be the thunder of heaven. You could actually, every place you put the sole of your foot, Joshua 1, 3, the kingdom of God would go with you because they're his feet now. They're not yours. You could walk in the highway of holiness, Isaiah chapter 35. You could walk in the narrow way of Matthew 6. You could walk through the narrow gate of Luke 13. You could walk in step with the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. You could walk yoked up with Jesus, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. You could walk even as Jesus walks, 1 John 2, 6. How are you going to do that? Give him your feet. Well, I don't know why I go to that pornography place. And I don't know why I go to that bar. I know you got to give him your feet. Amen. Then it says, cut off the head. I love this part. Oh, my word. This solves so many problems. If you've got a problem with sin, cut your head off and give it to God. You know what's in your head? Your eyes. You don't have to do what Job did. He made a covenant that he wouldn't look at anything vile. And David said the same thing. I'll make a covenant with my eyes. And because the eyes are the lamp of your body. But if your head's on the altar, God can turn your eyes wherever he wants to. In other words, if your eyes get on God's altar and he sanctifies you, he can give you power to look away. How about that? It's not your power, it's his power. You could actually have power to say no to ungodliness and yes to righteousness and holiness. You could see ladies as your sisters and men as your brothers if you get your eyes on the altar. I'm preaching pretty good here. And, and then another thing that's in your head is your ears. God actually cares what you hear. But if you give him your head, your ears are on the altar. And guess what else is in your head? Your mouth. Holy smokes. James says the tongue is hard to bridle, man. Unless, of course, you give God your head. Then you no longer are a gossiper and a whiner. You start becoming a worshiper and a praiser. Here's one. You ready for this one? If you give God your head and he has your mouth, you could stop gossiping and you could stop complaining and you could stop talking behind people's back and grieving the spirit because now he has control of your tongue. No more church hopping because churches wouldn't divide anymore because if God gets our tongue, all we'd be doing is prophesying and building each other up instead of tearing each other down. You know what else is in your head? Your brain. If you give God your head, you could have the mind of Jesus. You'd have the power to take any thought captive. You could set your thoughts on things above. How are you going to do that? Give him your head. And then it says take the inward parts out. This is where it gets a little hairy because it doesn't say take the inward parts out in your closet. It says keep them on the altar You know what the inward parts are? That's your secret life. That's what you do at midnight when your spouse is sleeping. Or at work when nobody's looking. 
That needs to go on the altar too. You, you mean up front and center? That's what I mean. You don't get to move the altar. It needs to move you. Are you with me? And then it says cut off the fat. You know what fat is? It's stored energy. You know what that is to me? That's a lot of people. I got saved in 1990, but I haven't led anybody to the Lord in 20 years. There's lots of people in the church that live on past experience. And God wants it all cut off, so we're relying on him for our daily bread. (laughs) There's not tears. It's all level at the foot of the cross. I'm not talking about anointing. I'm talking about your salvation. There's degrees of anointing, but don't ask for a double portion unless you're willing to lose more than your life. That's just words. So see, the burnt offering is is like it's a serious thing, but it pleases God. And when he's when he's pleased with it, the, the priest in his linen outfit, and I think linen represents the cool of the day, no condemnation. I think linen represents you are justified and you have peace with God, Romans 5 1. Linen represents that. I think linen represents there's no condemnation now, Romans 8 1. I think linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. I I believe linen we can kind of walk hand in hand with God with no shame like he did in the garden with in the cool of the day. Linen. And the priest would walk in an eight, which is mercy's new every day. And when it would burn down, they'd blow the trumpet and yell at the top of his lungs, it is finished. It is finished. Jesus didn't come up with that. Jesus fulfilled all law and prophecy. He made the old sacrifice obsolete, but ushering in a new covenant. Are you with me? He was just another high priest, happened to be the last one in the line of Melchizedek. So when he yelled, it is finished, he was completing it, and that completed it all. Aren't you glad? (laughs) Amen. The high priest would take off his linen outfit, and he would put on his ash outfit, and he would gather up those ashes, and he would take them to a designated spot and dump them in the ash heap. Because ashes aren't a bad thing. They're just the part God can't use. They're the remains. He can't use. They're things that we're supposed to get rid of. There's some things we're supposed to add to our faith, Second Peter chapter 1. If you do all those things, it says if you make your calling and election sure, you don't have to stumble. Things we add to. Ashes are things we remove. God consumes what he wants. What he doesn't want, he wants us to get rid of. What are ashes? Unforgiveness. Bitterness. Pride. Secrets. Shame, scars, I mean, this, this, I've been traveling for 32 months. I've been in 283 churches. I've seen 75,000 people come to the burnt offering. I've seen 8,000 people healed physically. I've seen over 1,000 pastors sanctified. Nothing happens unless you're willing to go all in on the altar. It, you're just, it's all smoke and mirrors if you're not willing to get on the altar. It's just talk. It's just lip service. He doesn't like that. He likes heart service. So instead of getting rid of the ashes, some people put them in urns, and they celebrate those urns, and they just do the little urn thing. And I'm not a victor. I'm a victim. I got hurt. Somebody abused me when I was a kid or... My spouse cheated on me or my house was torn out in the tornado or, and instead of being a victor and more than a conqueror, we become victims. And when you put things in urns, they're airtight and they're waterproof and they're fireproof and God's fire can't purify them and the washing of the word can't cleanse them and wash them and the glory of God can't get to them because they're just in this thing. And what goes in that urn, instead of being an altar person, we become an urn person now, now time doesn't heal. It just makes it worse. And you say, well, brother, I got over that until you see him on Facebook and you get sick or you see him in the grocery store and you get sick. You don't get over it unless it gets on the altar. (laughs) 
I want God to set us all on fire. But he can't do it unless we deal with sin, fear, and ignorance. Amen? And you say, well, Brother Dan, we're the, we're the saints. Who else would come to church on a Labor Day weekend on a Friday night after working all week? We're the saints. Let me tell you about saints. It took them 10 days. And they saw Jesus. It took them 10 days before God was satisfied with their gift before the fire fell. And these are guys in those 10 that their names are on like the foundations of the 12 gates in heaven. And their names are on the stained glass at Vatican City. And if they needed to take time so God could burn them up, probably Friday night Joplin Saints might need some fire too. (laughs) 